Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. We have a great show this evening for you. In just a minute, we have uh, Ted Rowe. This, uh, he's a uh, special guest that uh, kind of last minute, and we're going to be uh, talking about, I'm going to make things real confusing for everyone tonight. We're going to be talking about NARCAP a little bit, but no, he's got some things to announce. And the only reason I bring that up is because he's involved with that. But tonight, later on, the main guest is Jack Brewer. He's going to be talking about NICAP and uh, some other things as well. So uh, I know all these uh, um, all these things we have to keep track of, what means what and all that. And uh, so our guest has a great blog called the UFO Trail uh, blogspot.com. And uh, lots of information over there. Some people call him a skeptic. I think he's looking at, we can call him a skeptic. I've never shy away from having a skeptic on the show. I don't particularly like debunkers. I don't call him a debunker. But anyway, Jack Brew is a great guy coming up. And I want to say we have two shows this week. Thursday afternoon on YouTube and Facebook only is uh, Mark Ollie, And he's going to be talking about crystal skulls, which I've always had a fascination with. Uh, I went to Expo 67, you know, I think it was about 10 years after it was still open up in Quebec, Canada, and I saw a crystal skull there and I was totally mesmerized by it. And uh, some of them came from Mayan ruins. I'm not sure um, where this, uh, where these come from exactly. I know that there was a hoax out there at one time, uh, something supposed to be ancient. Anyway, check out, that's on the UFO, uh, I mean, it's on our our uh, YouTube channel only, and it's live streaming this Thursday at 3 p.m. Mark Ollie. And if you want to get notifications on YouTube, simply just subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell on the side. So this week's blog is uh, taken aboard a UFO and turned into a mutant. Now, this is a story of uh, Charles Lear, who does uh, writes our blogs, you know, talks a lot about people are, you know, have these incredible stories and not always, he doesn't always talk about things that are factual because of course a lot of this stuff or 99% of it can't be proven other than something happening. Anyway, it's a good read and check it out. It's kind of a short blog, but he also has a follow-up on the uh, update of Irma Rick, the story of the woman supposedly saying she was transported by a UFO in, in uh, Brazil um, I think it was, no, Argentina, I'm sorry. Um, she was supposedly transported in the middle of the night, 60 miles showed up with, uh, you, you know, where she couldn't have walked that far. Who knows whatever happened. It's an interesting story. And she certainly doesn't look like someone that could have, well, I shouldn't say it that way. She would have a hard time walking that far. Anyone would, but, uh, uh, I'll better just leave it at that. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so check out those blogs. And thank you, everyone who supports the show. I really appreciate it. I could not do that without you. I'm going to be on the road in a little while. I'm going to be doing the show from the road uh, for a little bit. And a lot of things coming up, a lot of great guests coming up and all that. For right now, I'm going to bring in Ted Rowe. He is in the Big Island over in Hawaii. Welcome to the show again, Ted. Thank you, Martin. Hello, everybody. Yeah. And uh, we see, are we seeing uh, like Mr. Fog behind you? Is that what that is? Yeah, probably. Um, I, I, we've got some weather coming through. It's uh, it, it rains where I'm at 200 inches a year. So yeah, it's there's like a, you can count on the rain every day, right? Every day. And this is actually a dry moment. So, <laughs> so you got it. You got it right now. We better hurry up. So uh, you sent me a text. I um, mean, you have kind of an uh, interesting announcement related to the UFO topic and, um, and something you said is pretty incredible after 50 years or something like that. And I'd love for you to sp spill it and tell us what's going on. Well, sure. Um, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, contacted me right after the ODNI report was released last uh, June um, and invited me to join a, a small group of speakers at their AV21 conference to advocate for the scientific study of UAP. And we did that. And then about a month later, they called us back and invited us to form into a development team to prepare a, um, a function inside of AIAA that would address UAP and aviation safety and also push back against the stigma that, that inhibits scientific engagement. And so wow. we spent Let's the stop. last 
yeah, we spent the last six months working on that that program, and and uh, the backstory is, is just that when I was a kid trying to resolve UFO experiences in my life and my family's life, I uh, I was looking up UFO in the card catalog at the library, and of course AIAA was right at the front with their statement on UFOs. They had taken a counter position to Project Blue Book and and Condon in their conclusions and advocated for further study. Uh, they had one, I think a local chapter did a conference on UAP in Los Angeles or something uh, shortly thereafter, and then it kind of died on the vine. Now, 50 years later, I'm part of that story, and it's, you know, it's kind, of a, kind of interesting, you know, from a couple of angles. Yeah, that, that, is, that is great. That is great. Uh, by the way, uh, a library is a place where they have books, just for, <laughs> and the card file is where you used to look up the book. Yeah. Right. Those Do days. Guess. Yeah. 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 But, uh, well, that's, that's pretty exciting. And, and so, yeah, the stigma, as you know, because of what you've been involved in and with, uh, NARCAP is, uh, and that's national aviation, can re national aviation reporting. Eh, yeah. What's, what's the on an almost yeah. Some else. Yeah. Like yeah, it is. It is. And um, just for the person who's never um, really looked into that at all, can you explain a little bit what that what's involved in that? Well, Dr. Haynes and I founded NARCAP in 1999-2000 uh, to address uh, UAP reports that involved aviation safety. And a lot of the pilot reports uh, have safety factors involved in the report, but the the data moves away from the aviation system and the safety planners that could use that information. So we mm -hmm. spent the last 22 years basically uh, advocating and collecting data on, on these types of incidents. Um, and then uh, the ODNI report came out and, and from their own data found the same concerns. Uh, and while, while this AIAA effort is not uh, derivative of NARCAP. We didn't, you know, they're not following our work. We're, we're in parallel with them. Uh, we both have the same concerns, pretty much the same perspective. Uh -huh. Now, um, one thing that always comes to mind when I talk to someone like you, and I don't know if I spoke to you about this before when you were on, but um, Gate C-17 back in 2007, O'Hare Airport was the, mm -hmm. the disc that was above the gate and then shot up through the clouds, left, punched a hole in it, for those of you that are new and have not really uh, looked at that story. But one of the things I've said when I've talked to people about this, well, enough time, that was 2007, so much time has gone by, there are people that should have retired by now that you think would be talking about it. And I, I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. It's, it's entirely possible. I, I haven't done any follow-up with witnesses over the years. Uh, for, you know, we keep seeing stories related to the the O'Hare incursion, uh, but we only found one person that even said that they had made, taken a photograph, or, or one person that was referred to as take, having taken a photograph, and they never stepped forward. I don't know if there was a photograph. All the photographic evidence I've seen has been, you know, hoaxed or fake. Uh, oh, yeah. So, and, and at the time, no cell phone cameras weren't that yeah. prominent, you know, and, and, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, it's not a hill. That case is not a hill to die on. It's just an example of an incursion into class B restricted air, airspace and, and the attempts to mitigate those things. And, and again, the data didn't go to safety planners. As it turns out, the FAA doesn't take UFO reports hasn't okay. for decades. And uh, so so here, uh, so if you've got a case that involves a UFO where you, where souls were on board and you were concerned, there's no nobody 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 cares. And well, I don't I don't I don't understand that if you really think about it. Like, that it's a safety issue, and why wouldn't why wouldn't they be interested in that? Well, uh, if you can imagine what it was like for the UAP task force to show up at the FAA offices and say, "Hey, show us all that great pilot UFO stuff you guys have," and they don't have anything. You know, oh, we, wow. we haven't been. I mean, if you look at the manual, the manual says take it elsewhere. The manual says if you want to report a UFO encounter, contact a civilian reporting system. 
Is that yeah, right? Yeah, it, does. it doesn't even make no. any sense to me because if they were flying by and there was a balloon or a drone or something, of course they'd report it, you know, through the FAA. And what is the difference that it's unknown? Well, well it's just a, it was something the candidate identified, and and that 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 standard is is unacceptable. We 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 briefed the um, aviation safety reporting system analysts down at the bunker uh, over over near Patel there outside of uh, uh, Ames Research Center uh, and talked to them about it. And they do get those reports often anonymous, um, but uh, that's the only place where pilots could go. Now that now that we have the the uh, Pentagon in the game and they're setting up uh, a reporting system across all government bureaucracies that centers in on their program, kind of like the French program at GPAN. Right. Um, yeah. Hopefully that that data will will first off, it'll be collected. But then the problem is, again, it moves away from the aviation system into the defense establishment. So aviation safety planners still don't have what they need, even though the ODNI report specifically stated that along with national security, they're a threat to aviation. So, you know, it, it, it's something we need to resolve. And and I'm hoping yeah. that our work through AIAA is going to um, help us, you know, address issues of, of data integrity and access. Yeah. Well, I learned something, Ted. Um, I had no idea that they, they washed their hands of, I just thought they didn't pass along any information, but I had no idea that they, they had nothing to do with UFO or UAP, as they say, reports. That is, if you look, if you look at the aeronautical instruction manual, you know the AIM, or you look at the air traffic control instruction manual, their entries on reporting UAP are the same, and they they don't do it. They don't oh, accept okay. it. They refer them outward. Interesting. Well, I hope the day comes where pilots uh, are not going to worry about losing their jobs, uh, you know, by reporting something because there's probably a lot more seen out there than ever reported. Absolutely. And, and I, that day is coming um, because, like I said, now the data is going to be collected and then it's a matter of us trying to get a hold of some of it so we can do the right thing with it in terms of making sure pilots are prepared for the unexpected. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, I, I wrote a pilot advisory about this. It's been read in 140 countries and it's just a conservative angle on how to deal with it. So, Yeah, um, I've been um, I I've told people before on the show that I, I was a former for a while, I was a, a flight attendant. And so I got to ride up in the cockpit a number of times and you can just see a vast area. I mean, you can see for miles and miles and miles on a clear day. It's amazing. I don't know how many miles it seems like, but it seems like you can see easily for a hundred miles. Well, so, sure, you sure. know, anything in the sky, you would think that um, that pilots would see more actually um, with all the reports on the ground, you'd think they'd see more than reported. Well, they do, and they're reticent to talk about it. I, 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 I can't tell you the number of times I've been somewhere and people know who I am, and somebody pulls me aside and said, "Hey, you know, I was an air traffic controller at X military base, or I was a, I was a pilot flying for something, and I want to tell you my story." And 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 so we get the stories. Uh, there, there's a lot more than we actually know about because the system's been hostile to. UAP yeah. Reporting. Excellent. I, I think it's starting to rain or those insects. Yeah, it's starting to rain. Right right on cue. So anyway, yeah. uh, Ted, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure talking to you. My Aloha. pleasure. Yeah. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye now. All right, everyone. So our guest, our main guest uh, tonight is coming up right now. Uh, Jack, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's always great to be here. Yes, I think it was up. Uh, it was 2016 when you were on before. As time just ticks away, it sure know? does. Yeah, and so you've been up to all kinds of things. Your your uh, blog is called the UFO Trail at Blogspot, and um, my friend wrote for you uh, way back in 2016 about hypnotherapy, and I thought that was interesting. Um, she remembered it, and I forgot all about it, but uh, you remembered every bit about it, so that's great. I did remember Donna, your friend. I remember that when I did your show before, she called in and we talked and I was interested enough in uh, her comments that she and I connected off of the show as well. And I uh, interacted with her some more by email and did a blog post about it. And 
Yeah. Uh, I, I think a lot of people have um, these interactions with UFO researchers and, and circumstances that arise that uh, are worthy of hearing and giving attention that they're just not willing to try to fight to get, you know, on the airwaves or get some attention to uh, their story because oftentimes they're very personal stories and they often involve people besides just ourselves as well. And right. uh, yeah, I, I certainly remember Donna and her circumstances and I'm glad to hear uh, she, she remembered it and I hope she valued it and that things are going well. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, well, it's always it's always great to have you on. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you if I announced you in the proper way, but I said I said uh, some people call you a skeptic. Would you say you're just looking at this topic um, logically is what I would say more than you're not a debunker. You don't bash people or anything like that. And someone wrote in somewhere in the chat room. I saw, well, he's not a debunker at all. So. Um, I never <laughs> called you one, and I'm. Um, I, but I, I like to hear uh, the skeptical side of things because I think um, I remember Stan Friedman says, you know, have an open mind, but don't let your brain fall out. You know. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, maybe debunking is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you wrote about well, you've you've written a, um, some books, and one of them. Um, we're going to be talking about a little bit later. And that was called the graves are framed, but just quickly touch on our, what's the title to that one? Exactly. The graves have been framed exploitation in the UFO community. And the graves have been framed was a phrase that, that kind of got batted around with some people I used to interact with online. And it was kind of a way to, try to reframe the way we think about things and the way that we look at things. And we could try a number of ways to tell people that uh, a lot of the UFO lore doesn't stand up to scrutiny or a lot of the claims are anecdotal and unsubstantiated. And one of the phrases that, that kind of seemed to fit that to try to get people to come at it from a different direction was just the grays have been framed, man. It's, you know, they, they haven't done everything that they're accused of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I've i always, you know, I was always on the fence with, you know, it's very interesting. And it just, I think it's interesting that people have reported seeing these beings that, you know, like on the Whitley Strieber book, you know, that look like look like that. And, um, you know, it's, it's been mentioned over and over again. And, and, you know, um, and then people are talk about characteristics of them being, um, almost, you know, emotionless and, you know, like drones doing their job or something like that. But, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, I, I, until I see one, I, I have to remain skeptic myself, but it is pretty interesting. It's not just here in this country, people are reporting it all over, some people say that it's, you know, pop culture influence, uh, you know, all types of things like that. So I, I have no idea. Yes. Um, Mr. Strieber's book cover communion, that's definitely a striking haunting image that, that influenced people quite a bit. I was talking with your support staff before the show. And I, I think that most all of us, Many of us uh, come at this topic because we think there's something to it. And uh, people that, that believe in an alien presence or an other or something to that effect, uh, they deserve the same dignity and respect that, that we would afford those who don't believe that or, or that we would afford anyone. And I think where some of the problems arise, Martin, is we begin to argue things from a personalized perspective, and it, it shouldn't always be that way. 
for instance, if I challenge things that a researcher has asserted, or if I challenge their methodology as being flawed and, and not as solid as they purport it to be, that is a different argument from does person A's experiences, were they real or were they imagined? But oftentimes an experiencer will um, kind of project the whole argument on if, if there's any substance to the UFO topic at all by questioning any one researcher or any one methodology or any single report. And it, it can become almost a reverse stigmatism that critical thinkers will shy away from the subject just because it and not because they're afraid of being criticized for looking at it, but they just don't want to get uh, publicly bashed and uh, have groups of um, pro-UFO people sent after them to discourage them from being critical. So it, it can almost become a reverse stigmatism, but I, I think everyone does deserve respect and uh, mm -hmm. tolerance about how they come to have the beliefs and the opinions they have. That could spread across of all parts of our society today. That that way of thinking, you know, uh, because we, we, you know, we're very divisive these days in so many ways. And and um, you know, uh, if we can relax a little bit and let people believe what they want, as long as they're not hurting other people, you know, what's the harm mm -hmm. in that? Mm -hmm. That type of thing. But um, so let's hear about. Um, NICAP. I think this is very interesting um, that there may be uh, an intelligence, a U.S. intelligence connection. And what what led you down this path? Well, the short answer to that is uh, there's certainly a, a U.S. and CIA intelligence connection with NICAP. And its purposes become a bit more up for debate. What, what led me down that path is the more and more I, I got interested in this, Martin, and after going to a ridiculous amount of MUFON meetings and UFO conferences and reading this and listening to that, I came to the conclusion that one really cannot solve a scientific question with, with a laptop and, and no equipment. You, you know, you, you, I understand why people investigate UFO sightings. I understand why they interview experiencers. I, I get that some people are interested in it. But after chasing my tail long enough, I became much less interested in stories that have no resolution, and I became much more interested in the social circumstances and materials that uh, are available through the Freedom of Information Act and newspaper yeah. archives and uh, various um, material and records that are recognized as uh, professional research standards. And so one of the things that, that I was interested in was where the intelligence community overlaps with the UFO community. And so I was interested in Bill Moore and the 1990s heyday of ufology. Yep. And of course, the more recent uh, a tip story and, and to the Stars Academy and that kind of thing. But it seemed like I was overlooking a big a big piece of the IC UFO community connection with NICAP. And so I really didn't know much about the 
National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, a mid-20th century UFO group. And when I began looking into it, uh, I started doing some FOIA requests and finding more and more uh, ties to um, high-ranking members of the CIA. And there was just an undeniable connection between a group of people that were on the outskirts of the CIA and organizations that were contracted by the CIA and directors and key personnel of the CIA directly correlated with the people that incorporated NICAP and ran it initially. And I started out doing some blog posts about it and was surprised how much material directly corroborated these circumstances. So I ended up putting it in a book and am still getting more material, as I say, from newspaper archives, FOIA requests. Uh, there's a great deal of material available in um, archive collections at colleges, letter, letters that are saved and things like that, that from the best I can tell are virtually untapped resources. And I hope to be looking into some of that. And I can understand People are interested in UFOs and they want to hear about aliens. And so oftentimes if, if there's not a flying saucer in this story, they're not really interested. But I think we're really overlooking a big part of the cultural puzzle, the social puzzle, how all of this stuff came to be in so many of our daily lives and our, our forward thinking consciousness if we don't go back and look at how some of the original American UFO groups were formed and incorporated and what some of those initial intentions may have been that then it all just kind of snowballed out of. Um, there was a story that uh, Ray Stanford told me. Are you familiar with who Ray Stanford is? I am. Yeah. He told me that he was involved in a conference and that all of a sudden had funds of $75,000 and a shell company that he traced back to American, you know, like a, it was through the intelligence or I would have to talk to him more about it. But, uh, you know, there was it was a kind of a big deal at the time. And this was going back to the 1970s. It was very expensive, and all of a sudden it was paid for. So, <laughs> are they? Would you say that this is they're possibly looking to get inside information about what's going on with the public, or what's going on with, you know, the possibility of UFOs and us being visited? Which would you say? Which would you think? I tend to think the latter is a low priority. I, I don't think that uh, Director Hillencoder with the CIA would have come to a civilian organization, for instance, to learn about UFOs and, and potential aliens. That's just my opinion. What I feel pretty confident about is that the purpose of the intelligence community involvement, the CIA involvement, the DIA involvement, I think it changes from one instance to another, one specific circumstance to another, and one era to another. And in NICAP's uh, instance, the Cold War was a big deal. I think that Things played in like the NICAP director, Donald Kehoe, his signature move was getting leaks out of the military from pilots, from people that would 
give him documents, give him stories. I mean, let's face it, the, the FBI is not doing its job if it's not interested in those leaks. And it doesn't have to be for the purpose of what the leaks are about. Hmm. Uh, something else, the first thing that came to mind, Martin, when you mentioned that uh, Mr. Stanford said the intelligence community had set up a conference. It's now known that it's a, it was a pretty common tactic at one time to set up academic international conferences and that that was used by foreign intelligence services as well as American intelligence services to try to recruit spies. And it put the leaders in the field in physics, communications, photography, whatever the conference was about, at events. And there were a number of spy techniques tried, like in more recent times, it would be uh, here, here's my memory stick, unload my project into your laptop. And then when you get the memory stick back, you've got everything off of the people's laptop or you're planning spyware and and this kind of thing and uh the conferences were an opportunity for intelligence gathering and trying to recruit spies so in the ufo uh genre context we've long had a a lot of people in the defense community that take interest in UFOs. And and mm -hmm. that's understandable. Uh, you know, Martin Marietta contractors, people like that have a history of being interested in the topic and what's flying around. So I could potentially see, and that was the first thing that came to mind with the, the story about Mr. Stanford, that the intelligence community had set up a conference to try to uh, see who maybe is targeting these people that have security clearances in a professional capacity or any number of intelligence or counterintelligence opportunities. As a matter of fact, in my book, I uh, discovered that um, Dr. Donald Menzel, a uh, mid 20th century um, PhD worked with the intelligence community, spent his life basically under surveillance because of the classified projects he worked on. After some 30 years of FBI memos about making sure that this guy is, is not reporting to Russia, isn't in bed with China or anything like that, uh, I found memos that they, uh, the Washington field off or the Boston field office for the FBI was requesting from director Hoover permission to groom Dr. Menzel as a, an informant or counter agent because he was still at that point in his career traveling to China and going to international conferences. So it, it's really hard to separate uh, the intelligence aspects from the UFO steeplechase. And it's just something that most people understandably don't even take into consideration when they're just heading off to a MUFON meeting or an SCU meeting, and they want to hear about what's the latest UFO buzz, what's been going on, and those of us like me who are not in that line of work have not ever been employed in the intelligence community it it's really a whole uh different way of looking at things to start seeing it through that kind of lens i remember again i just brought up stan friedman a little while ago and i remember one of the times i spoke with him he was talking about dr menzel from the harvard Harvard Astronomy, uh, I believe that's right, and that he figured out in a roundabout way that he did have a, a clearance, a security clearance, and was involved in something. So uh, that's kind of an interesting tie-in, you know, basically to it. Yes, it is. Um, uh, 
my research indicates that Dr. Menzel was involved um, in some applications of astronomy to spying and code breaking and sending codes of all things. And it had to do with work he was doing about the most advantageous time to send and intercept messages based on atmospheric conditions. And uh, that was just one of the things he did. And uh, I also found some interesting archives where he exchanged letters with uh, CI director, CIA director Hillencoder, who also served, ironically, as the NICAP chairman of the board for a few years. And uh, they had a debate about UFOs, and it became apparent in these letters that Hillencoder was telling Menzel one thing, and then he would tell NICAP director Donald Kehoe another thing. And so I found that interesting that Hill and Coder seemed to be kind of talking out of both sides of his mouth about what his position on UFOs was. And also um, Menzel was uh, purported to be one of the Majestic 12, the MJ-12, as was Hill and Coder. And the letters between the two certainly put that to bed, that if the two of them were aware of any uh, flying saucer retrievals, they were sure playing the long game in their letters so that 60 years later when we read them, we will think that they didn't know anything about flying saucers. <laughs> interesting. Wow. Uh, Kehoe, uh, what an interesting uh, character he was. Uh, wasn't he in, he was in the Navy, was it? I'm trying to remember what branch. I believe, military. I believe Marines. Um, and he was a pilot and he was an interesting character. He, he wrote extensively for pulp magazines before he got involved with NICAP and, uh, had attracted the attention of the FBI, um, some 20 years prior to his NICAP involvement in the 1950s. So as early as I think like 1935, uh, he, he was attracting attention about something or other. I tried to FOIA that and find out more and they were unable to locate the records, but the FBI was able to give me documents that, that demonstrate that, um, Director Hoover and his staff did not think highly of Kehoe's writing about the FBI and felt that uh, things that Kehoe was um, promoting were irresponsible. Like at one point he had written that, uh, I think he wrote that the Nazis had a plan to take over the merchant marines or something to that effect and that the FBI was aware of the plan. And of course, that's the kind of thing that would get Hoover's attention and that would certainly get on his bad side. Hmm. Hmm. But I thought he was a, I thought he was an advocate. You know, he was really a uh, pushing for you know i mean like people do today you know let's let's talk about this and you know so that's another reason he was probably looked on you know down upon and i believe there's a mike wallace or some i'm trying to remember a great interview with him that you can find right have you ever that seen that's him? correct kehoe was definitely what we today would call a disclosure advocate he very much believed in a UFO presence and thought that it was, and I thought that UFOs represented interplanetary spacecraft. One of my criticisms of NICAP was that they promoted themselves as a scientific research organization. And in many aspects they were but they also used it as somewhat of a facade to try to deflect criticism. 
and they sent out a lot of things that that would not be a lot of material and literature that would not and should not be considered uh, in line with, by definition, scientific investigation. And Kehoe, at least outwardly, and I tend to think this is correct, became convinced that the FBI, the CIA, the Air Force were hiding its their knowledge of an extraterrestrial presence. And he felt like the key to getting this proof and this knowledge was through people leaking documents and through congressional hearings, uh, much like we're seeing today. There are a lot of parallels between the NICAP saga of the 1960s and today. And Kehoe essentially became a lobbyist, whether he may have considered himself that or not. And NICAP successfully got congressional hearings that didn't turn out as they had hoped they would. And, and there's a whole, you know, list of different opinions on how and why that happened. That the, the bottom line is people that want to believe are always going to play the cover up card. And those of us that that might be a bit more even-handed or skeptical are going to say, well, maybe that's so, but it hasn't been proven. And if, if there is proof somewhere, it, it hasn't come out. And pretty much every conceivable attempt has been made by a politician, a uh, politician, a disclosure activist, uh, military intelligence people, um, all of the things that we see happening today happen in spades with NICAP that uh, directors of intelligence agencies, career intelligence officers, CIA officers were going on the record talking about their belief about flying saucers. And was some of that sincere? I would think so. Maybe most of it. I don't think all of it was. I, I think there were there were mixed agendas. And uh, I tend to think so for what I was discussing earlier, reasons as I mentioned earlier, that uh, there was a lot of obstruction about the backgrounds of the people that incorporated NICAP. And uh, the same way that we know now that academic conferences can be used as an intelligence community tool, we also know now that nonprofit corporations, 501c3 corporations such as NICAP, were commonly used by intelligence agencies to distribute funds and to covertly move money around. And uh, I think that that might play into the story as well. I, th I think when NICAP was first incorporated by intelligence community assets, I think that they had some different ideas about where it might go. Mm -hmm. And then that's back to we, how we were saying the, the, the particular change from one instance to the next. Sometimes they might be looking for leaks. Sometimes they might be doing counterintelligence and trying to find out what foreign adversaries are interested in making connections with these leaks. Sometimes they might be planning disinformation about uh, fabricated weapon systems that don't really exist. Like you might be aware or your audience might be aware that James Carrion has done some good work and uncovered uh, the misrepresentation of Project SEAL in the late 1940s that was misrepresented to the press to be an airborne weapon as powerful as the atomic bomb. And 
uh, carry on found in his research that in actuality it had been it had been shelved and uh, dissolved like a year before it was being misrepresented to the press. And I, I just think, you know, there is pick a card, any card, you know, there's just there's at least 52 reasons of why the intelligence community might be interested in games like that from one specific instance to the next. Now, uh, Colonel or retired Colonel Joseph Bryan the third, he was a bit was he a bit controversial was because there was a rumor that he was definitely involved in the CIA or something, right? Yes. Uh, Colonel Bryan was virtually certainly a CIA officer as represented in the New York times and, and other uh, media outlets. And a number of these people like, like Joseph Bryan is one has been of, great interest to historians over the years for reasons that have nothing to do with UFOs. And that is because Colonel Bryan and some of the other NICAP people played significant roles in American and global politics. Uh, Nicholas de Roquefort is one that, that uh, has been the subject of CIA lawsuits to try to get records on him that, that was an original NICAP organizer. And like Colonel Bryan, was a expert in psychological warfare. And Colonel Bryan was one who was uh, with NICAP almost its entire life cycle. And he sat on the board and uh, had connections in the intelligence community that, that go back to the early 1950s. He reportedly worked in the Office of Policy Coordination. And uh, as I've said, my general thesis is there's this group that we can put directly with NICAP. If we want to start letting me get manic and sticking pins all over the wall like that meme that goes around, yep. this this Office of Policy Coordination just had a, a whole crew of people that keep popping up during the 1950s in uh, the CIA and the UFO community and had organizations linked to it that were gathering information for it and acting as assets abroad that were directly involved in incorporating and initially operating NICAP. I'm personally skeptical of the MJ-12 uh, papers and uh, also the one signed by Eisenhower um, because that's a that, that signature. I mean, it, it, it just, I mean, it's his signature, but it could have so easily been floated on a copy, which that is, it's not a, it's not an original, but anyway, being skeptical of all that. And also we can talk a little bit about Bill Moore. Um, but do you think there was actually some type of organization like MJ 12 headed by these people like, um, Menzel and people like that? In the spirit of the question, no, I, I do not. Um, were there meetings? Were there discussions? Um, could you really try to take a square peg and pound it into a round hole somewhere or other? Probably, maybe. Um, but in the spirit of your question, do I think there was something resembling an uh, elite task force that uh, that that retrieved crashed alien spacecraft? I, I just, you know, would have no reason to believe that without further documentation. Right. And when this um, when this came out, going back to the papers when they came out, there were so many people that were really thinking, thinking it was, you know, that's the smoking gun. You know, this is this is definitely it and all that. And, um, you know, in recent years or the last year or year or two, I would say, we have the Wilson document. Have you 
looked into that. I mean, I personally think that's kind of along the same line. Um, you know, supposedly Eric Davis was involved, but he won't say whether he was or not. And it took place in Las Vegas. And, um, you know, it's another very similar, it seems like another s similar type of situation. Have you looked into that at all? I have um, the the outskirts of it. I haven't done a deep dive. And it's the very type of circumstance, like I touched on earlier, that I, I got to where I lost interest in uh, all of these narratives that rely on trusting someone about what they say they saw or what they say someone told them. And uh, like, like I said, I used to go to conferences and I would uh, talk to and interview some of the intelligence community members. And I learned some things from it. But one of those things I learned was there, there's never a, a time coming that they're just going to say, well, you asked the question in the right way. Let me get out my briefcase. And I have those documents right here to give you is just not coming. Like, like what can anyone possibly say that would matter? You know, like if Colonel John Alexander told me unequivocally, I saw this, that and the other and it exists. Well, all I've got is a statement. What difference does it make? So we have to get the documents and we have to get the supporting evidence that is available for public review and that qualified scientists put a pencil to it and it passes peer review and it's not under uh, some, some chain of circumstances that these PhDs like to wink and say, I can't talk about that. I'm just not even interested anymore. And I know we're kind of talking about these subjects, and this has some revel, uh, relevance to it, but Bill Moore, he came out you know, during our, he basically came out, said that he was working. Was it for the CIA? Who is he was working for some type of intelligence? Uh, he I think he believed them to be connected to the CIA and that the um, Air Force, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations that, that plays pretty heavily into the NICAP saga as well. And Moore believed that if he played ball, and put some stories into the UFO community as he was given to put, that then he would get the, the, the goodies, that, he, that they'd dance with him and reward him with the kind of information he wanted. And eventually he, he decided the reward wasn't coming and he came clean with the whole story that he had been acting as what he believed to be a disinformation mouthpiece for the intelligence community. And so then we're left with which story do you want to believe? You want to believe the one that he's saying he, he uh, is coming clean, or do you want to believe the one before he, he has his... Uh, come to Jesus moment and day of reckoning or, uh, y you know, it's just tough when, when someone says I'm a liar and I'm being honest, but now listen to this. <laughs> and, uh, I, I tend to think Moore's story is, is corroborated enough with the, the Paul Benowitz affair and things like that, that it, it looks pretty solid. There was certainly shenanigans going on. It, it's certainly a concerning story with Richard Doty and the whole chain of events. But uh, again, we're just left with people made a lot of statements about stuff. And as my uh, my buddy Tim Banal says, show me the alien. Just show me the alien, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty funny. Uh, yep. Yeah, so someone put in here, let's see, what do you think about the Halt memo? Have you, I mean, that's uh, Charles Halt wrote about Rendlesham Forest 
um, you know, he basically, I think he actually put in the wrong date, something like, I know something like that had to do with, you know, radar, uh, they were looking into it, but, but basically this was, uh, he, uh, is supposedly happened early morning on the 27th of December, 1980. And he talks about, you know, the security seeing this, uh, triangle shaped UFO, blah, blah, blah. Um, so someone just in chat just wanted to know what you thought about that memo. Have you ever looked at it? My general opinion on Rendlesham is that it's a fascinating case. I have not gone into all of the minutia. It's not one of the cases I have, have picked up the gauntlet. I felt like enough talented, uh, competent people have. And my general opinion on it is that it's another in a long line of fantastic ufo stories that happen to center around a bunch of military people and so so we can take that to mean whatever we want it to mean and uh again we have a story that something happened and i think that's just kind of the long and the short of it yeah yeah it's interesting i've talked to a number of people involved and it it is uh you know, it's kind of convoluted with all, you know, the different witnesses that 1980 goes back a long time now. And your memory is not everyone's memory falters a little as they rethink and retell the stories over the years. So, yeah, as time, the further away we get from any of these things, you know, talking about Roswell way back, that that's so long ago. Um, you know, I don't know if we'll ever know exactly what happened there there's there's you know uh, often people will say why do you even talk about that case um you know as if nothing you, you know new could ever come about and most likely it won't at this point yeah yeah i i'm definitely on the same page with you there and in fact i think with the whole memory thing um, one of the criticisms I would make of the UFO scene is that we tend to skip the basics, like we were saying about understanding the intelligence community and want to go for the good stuff. You know, show me the alien. Where's the flying saucer in this story? Um, just, just tell me, you know, what did you see? That kind of stuff. When... I was interested enough in this that I, I read arguably an inordinate amount of material on the peripheral topics like memory and hypnosis as a memory retrieval tool and things like that. And uh, you're, you're absolutely just hitting the nail on the head there, Martin, that um, I, for instance, had a UFO sighting many years ago, and from what I've read about memory, I'm to the point where I like really don't even want to talk about it with people and stuff because I probably don't know what happened. All right, you so know? now we're going to talk about it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, you um, end up yeah. you end up with a memory of telling the story. That's you know. exactly, I, I've been doing, I, I've talked about this on this show a few times that I myself too have been looking into memory and you know, you, you, you're exactly right. You start piecing back what you, each time you think of something, you're rebuilding it in your head, you're rebuilding it in your mind and you're rebuilding it from what you remembered the last time you told it, you know, so it's, uh, it is, it is, uh, very faltering. You know, I thought, I had my UFO sighting I've told on this this show many times. It was not real exciting, but I'd like to think that I have it accurately, but, you know, perhaps I don't, you know. And uh, I remember recently I was thinking, was that 2006 or 2007? I wasn't, you know. So, but I do, uh, honestly, even though you don't want to tell it, I do want to hear about your UFO story. If you don't I, I was a child in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I... Uh, saw something that um it it's hard to describe we might describe it as a v or protractor shaped that was spinning and so as an adult i think back it was nighttime 
I think back and think, okay, I guess maybe the way lights were hitting an object made it look like um, something spinning in that way, uh, trying to, you know, get my mind wrapped around what it might have been. And uh, at this point in my life, it just kind of come to the realization, I don't know, and I'm just okay with, I don't know what I saw. And that's just kind of how it has to be. And mm. um, the more we talk about these things, then the more people are entitled to want to ask questions. And, okay, well, mm -hmm. wh what? where were you? What was the date? Let's look at airplane traffic. Let's look at weather forecast. And then you start having people trying to tell you what happened. And... Uh, it, it should come as no surprise. It often tends to be what they think happened to them that they start telling you is projected is, like, mm -hmm. yeah, is what you witnessed. And uh, that's actually how I got into a lot of the skeptical side of my points of view was experiencing that there can be such a uh, feeling of people pulling on each arm in a different direction in the UFO genre to try to get you in the alien camp or the interdimensional camp or the mind control camp or, you know, the, what was it that happened? And, you know, and then there's people that would say, I don't know, you, you saw a weather balloon with, with lights bouncing off it. How should I know? And, uh, so kind of back to where we started, I really empathize with people and want to give them their space for their self-discovery. And at the same time, the, the skeptics um, have that right to, to, to say, I don't know if somebody's jumping out here saying they've got material from a uh, interplanetary or interdimensional spacecraft that they're doing tests on, um, that, that requires a little more than just, you know, anecdotal personal stories, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're just joining us live now, we're on with Jack Brewer. And I did want to announce that this is our 499th show. So that means next week is 500 and next week's going to be a call-in show. So I want any, everyone that's uh, listening to this to get ready to call in next week. And uh, if we, Bill's probably going to help me out if we don't, if we have some dead space, but uh, get your questions ready for next week. It's a call in show. should be a lot of fun. Speaking of that, um, in about uh, 20 minutes, we'll be opening up the phone lines. If you have any uh, questions for our guests uh, this evening, uh, Jack, here's a, a question someone are you even familiar with the term hitchhiker effect i am familiar yeah so someone want to know uh if you had anything like that um with your experience i guess uh, a lot of people maintain that they are having these things kind of follow them which is kind of interesting i um uh, i think that kind of falls into a belief system Personally, I do not think that I have some type of phenomenon, um, any supernatural phenomenon uh, in my life. I would not want to, to debate people that believe they do if, if that's uh, what what they want to go with, far be it from me to argue it, as long as they don't want to impose that belief on me. I, I think we're really looking at like two different sets of circumstances here, Martin, in that there's hanging out with friends late night at Denny's and somebody tells you about something that happened to them once and you're giving them emotional support for their belief system. Mm -hmm. Then there are people that want to take podiums at quote conferences, unquote, and present their material as researchers 
and then we as researchers or an interested public have the right and the responsibility to fact check it and hold them responsible for the assertions they make if their uh, assertions do not hold up to the evidence. They, like if the evidence they presented is not in proportion to uh, the, and, and in my opinion, the hitchhiker effect falls into that category. I understand it's long been a part of the UFO lore, the multiple abductions in families, the multiple experiences. And um, I wouldn't argue if someone has that belief in a religious or spiritual or personal context. But if you want to present it to me as a researcher happening in an objective reality, I would uh, want to see uh, the specific data that shows cause and effect there. I don't think I'm, I'm certain has not been established. Yeah, it seems like that would be kind of a nightmare, you know, I mean, if you think about it. Uh, you know, I mean, just a, a terrible thing to like think you're done with something and then something keeps happening. And uh, it gets really existential if we let it, you know, like um, I got a phone call. I got in my car. I drove to the grocery store. I got another phone call. Well, they're not related in the least. And in the grand scheme of things everything's directly related and is on a cause and effect timeline. So, you know, how, how existential and philosophical do we want to get? Or like I say, are we going to stick to in, in a research recognized by the professional research community and those kinds of standards of evidence? Can you show me the, the, chain of cause and effect that these circumstances are directly related right um someone wants this is a question that i often ask myself is just for an opinion and uh, that is uh, do you believe that it's probable that some of these ufos are otherworldly devices i ask i ask in general that question like what do you think that people might be seeing if it's not explainable in our terms that if it's not something that we can explain from here. Um, I I'm smiling because I, I, my first thought was just, you know, well, my opinion, no, I, I don't think so. And then I thought, and then the host will go, well, thanks for joining us. We'll, we'll move <laughs> along to somebody cool. else that like David Letterman said once, yeah. maybe I can come over to your house and chew gum sometime. I remember uh, he said that to, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember who that was. Uh, Rivers, uh, no, that was yeah, question. yeah, um, Joaquin, Phoenix. Joaquin, yeah, Phoenix. yeah, 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 he yeah. in an interview, I remember, yeah, that. Remember yeah, Marcus. that was bizarre, yeah. So, no, I don't think it, it's probable. I think there's a lot of explanations for UFOs, I think there's a whole lot of them, um, exotic classified aircraft, misidentifications of identifiable flying objects, weather phenomena, uh, just general tricks on your eyes. Are some of them representations of some kind of yet to be better understood phenomena? Well, the Brown Mountain Lights, the work being done in Hesdalen, uh, might lead us to think that is the case. Um, I wouldn't rule it out. I don't think that's what critical thinking and healthy skepticism is about. But I think it's a very small percentage of the the cases that that we're looking at, and uh, that's just my opinion. Well, you know, there are some cases, and I even brought this up last week. You know, the Ariel School incident in South Africa. To me, that's an incredible case 
Um, then there's, you know, the 2004 Tic Tac with military involved, once again, military, um, but with a lot of data with that, that is very hard to explain. Some people claim that they think it may be, as you said, something military, but that doesn't really fit in the realm of what happened there. So, yeah, I think there's, I'm, I'm never saying that I know what these things are. And I tell people if they're interested in, um, you know, paying attention to the subject, if someone says they know what it is, then run, you know, because uh, I don't think anyone has the real answer, you know, to what it to what it really is at this point for all of them. Some of them, I, I'm glad when things can get explained as to what they are myself when someone figures it out. I mean, I myself, I brought this up recently. I'll just put it up as just a quick little clip. But um, I thought I was seeing a UFO right here. I'm going to play it right now. And what it really is, um, if you're looking, it's hard to see this. It looks like a, a disc here. And then all of a sudden you see it goes sideways. And then you see two. And it kind of disappears and they and they both come back. And what it was, uh, as it got closer, it was an airplane that had a banner behind it and it was turning around. And I, mm. I had just got to Miami and I thought for sure I was seeing myself a UFO right off the bat as soon as I got to where I was. I was like, oh my God. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, I like when those things can be explained. I mean, it would be really amazing if it was unexplainable, but that one, you know. Yes, the banner airplanes are are a big one. Um, I've seen clips over the years that looked absolutely fascinating, and then they were able to correlate it with a flight pattern of a, a plane with a banner. And then when you look at it, when you're told what it is, you can kind of see it. Yeah. But, but yeah, um, I had a similar experience once uh, with – You've heard that people mistake birds oh, at yeah. night for UFOs. Yes. And I, I remember they used to tell us that at the planetarium when we were kids. And I was like, what kind of idiot, you know, mistakes a goose for uh, the mothership, you know? And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, oh, I thought I saw a star cruiser from another solar system. My bad. It's just a dub, you know? Well, mo mother goose. No? Yeah. 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 And no. then one night, oh, as bad. they say, I'm walking across the parking lot and out of the corner of my eye, I see what for all the world, looks like a saucer shaped craft going at an incredible speed all the way across the sky. Hmm. And fortunately at the angle I was standing, I was able to see for a brief instant when the, when it, when this bird flew out of the light that was reflecting on its belly, looking yeah. like a saucer shape, yeah. I saw for an instant as it flew through the dark and then on out of sight. And it was only, you know, maybe 60, 70 feet off the ground. And because, and I, I actually thought it's kind of ironic. I've spent so much more time looking at, clips and photos of saucers that my mind immediately goes to no. must be a saucer eight miles high flying at an incredible rate of speed right. rather than a bird 75 feet at the air you know headed home with some dinner or whatever it was doing and uh it yeah i mean who knows how many people like I was saying, you know, whatever I saw when I was a kid just becomes a lifelong quest to find the answer to this mystery that um, almost is like a karmic joke, uh, you know, a, a uh, could, could even be considered um, a cruel joke if it was just something um, mundane like that. But, Again, you know, existentialism in the grand scheme of things, if it helps us with our own self-discovery, well, then, you know, whatever it is that does the trick, I guess. Right. Uh, I was sent uh, uh, people. A lot of people will send me their 
UFO video clips. I'm not really the person to send that to. And uh, I have a friend, Mark D'Antonio, that is a person to send that to, but he's very busy. You know, people send him things all the time. But I do get a lot of clips. And recently I had one sent to me and I figured out that it was a bird. You know what I mean? And But the person did not really want to hear that, you know, mm -hmm. and got, seemed to get pretty pretty upset at me by um, by calling it a bird. But I could clearly see after I blew it up on my, I have a big screen, I blew it up, you could easily see that it was, was a bird. And it was just the angle it was at, you couldn't see the wings flapping. You know, that's yeah. it's always about angles and light reflection. And a lot of times you'll see birds at a very high altitude that are catching the sunlight from an angle and they'll look like orbs. So there's a lot of times birds do look very mysterious. And um, so, yeah, we all have to be uh, have to be careful of what we're looking at. Yes. And what you experienced is another aspect, the detrimental side of UFO investigation and investigating uh reports of what we might call high strangeness alien abduction for lack of a better term that it people often don't want uh to to hear what it is that that we might as researchers actually think happened and i think as witnesses we have some responsibility then like how i said i really don't want to talk a lot about my ufo sighting i have a responsibility to decide am i looking for emotional support or am i looking for uh investigative support what kind of support am i looking for because they're completely different and as investigators, we have the responsibilities to make clear what we're willing to give. And it's very difficult to try to be someone's friend and an objective investigator and give them emotional support and then also uh, be honest to them when we need to that um, I, I think, you know, that that these 18 things you think were all strange, like at least 15 of them, I think you're just kind of lumping in with, with a couple of things, you know, again, we don't know what the cause and effect is and it, it can get very challenging. And as both investigators and witnesses, we have responsibilities to clarify what we're looking for from a person. And if, we're able to give it or if they're able to give it i think mm -hmm. um here's a question from kelly kid what do you think about the skinwalker ranch and this can nicely segue into something you sent me earlier today yes i um my general thinking about the skinwalker ranch is i i know maybe i'm not very interested but i'm predictable <laughs> I'm kind of a broken record about, uh, and again, as Banal says, show me the alien is the short answer for, um, I've heard data is being scientifically cataloged for 40 years, and I've yet to see a coherent, cogent representation of what any of it is or what it's supposed to tell me. So until that time comes, I have really no choice but to shrug my shoulders and say the best you can do is suspend judgment. And if people want to start being cynical and critical, I, I think they have a right. Um, what Martin is alluding to that I, I told him about earlier is just yesterday I got some documents back from the Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA, that was reportedly the uh, the agency that contracted the Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Application Program 
which I think many of us came to know as OSAP. Uh, it's the Pentagon UFO program, or at least one aspect of it. And the DIA um, uh, gave me verification through um, some FOIA documents that uh, Bigelow Aerospace did, in fact, uh, get an award for the OSAP project in that they, they got the grant. Um, as reported by Harry Reid. And uh, interesting aspects of the FOIA release uh, that you can see, you can access all of the documents and, and read my blog post about it at my blog, The UFO Trail. Interesting aspects about it include that uh, there were people affiliated with the project hyping it up and saying how effective it was at what we now know was the same time that it was being um uh, funding was being resisted by the department of defense the dia the department of homeland security and uh there's some different ways we could take uh, different things we could take away from that as we mentioned earlier, there's certainly an aspect of it that's uh, among what we might call a um, credulous crowd that is always going to say uh, they were on to something and the government's hiding it. And then there's a skeptical crowd that, that might say um, the the funding review boards that would give out funding to continue these projects was apparently um, more difficult to convince than some of the journalists that ran with the story. And then there are some more middle of the road that might say, uh, well, it got some money and it did get funded. Bigelow did get funding. And we need to see if anything significant came of this. There, there is nothing in the documents that would specifically indicate it was about UFOs or UAP as compared to uh, weapons applications programs. Um, the, the theoretical papers that have already been discussed widely. And another interesting aspect of it, something that jumped out at me, Martin, was one of the contracts that the DIA gave me says that Bigelow Aerospace was to be paid $10 million from the National Security Agency. And I don't know exactly why checks would be cut from the NSA if it was a DIA project. I'm not familiar enough with their protocol and with their protocol in 2009, 2010 to know why that might be. Um, I did remember, though, there have long been rumors that the NSA was involved at Skinwalker Ranch. And so I, I kind of wondered if this at least uh, is some of the uh, source of where some of these rumors come from. Hmm. Well, it, it's, it's all interesting. And do you think that there is the possibility that there's some documents that have just not been found yet? Or do you think that? You know, yes, I, I anticipate that DIA will be giving us a significant amount in a document release sometime after the end of the year. They continue to uh, make uh, me and other FOIA researchers aware that a number of our FOIA requests on documents uh, pertaining to ATIP and OSAP and uh, general UFO program stuff, like any contracts they had, deliverables, reports that were filed. Uh, a lot of those FOIAs remain open, and the DIA tells us that sometime around the end of the year, they plan 
to release the material that they have been reviewing. And at that point in time, they will post it, the DIA will post it at their FOIA online reading room. Interesting. Um, and I've, I've saw documents recently come out through John Greenwald's Black Vault. Does this have anything to do with, do, are they related in any type of way? Probably so. John, um, d he do has done a lot of FOIA work on the Pentagon programs. So um, if it's DIA and Bigelow, it probably is related. Yes. Yeah. He's been doing such uh, great work for so many years. Pretty amazing. Since he was like young, 16 years old or something like that. Right. Uh, when he started, which is pretty amazing. And uh, yeah, that uh, I think his that website gets I forget how many views per day, but it's it's amazing how, how many people come to that every single day and look for, for something, you know, with a, I, I don't know how many documents are on there, but it's. I, I've I certainly used it as a source. He has done admirable work with the FOIA. Right, right. And it's not an easy thing to do. You know, from what I understand, you have to be very precise. And there's so many ways your request can be rejected. And mm -hmm. and you have to be very specific at what you're want, wanting. And they can jump right over the topic you want if you say it in some type of unusual way or whatever. Yes. And in best case scenarios, it, it can even take years. Sometimes not, sometimes a few weeks, depending on what it is um, that we ask for. But the general way to do it is request a lot of stuff regularly. Um, I do maybe... I don't know. I probably average two or three requests a week. And then over time, you get to where uh, you're getting something once a week or so. Like after two or three years, you're, you're getting something to read and look at. And I don't want to look for just arbitrary things. Like I don't want to just be a thorn in their side. So uh, like NICAP, I probably have, oh gosh, probably 80 different FOIA requests on one person or another or a board they were affiliated with or an office of the CIA. And so as those continue to come in, I'll keep posting them. But yeah, it, if you just send one request and wait four years to see what they say, it, it can be very uninteresting that way. Yeah. Okay. The lines are open. The phone number is 855-472-5483. Bill is standing by if you'd like to call in for our uh, guest tonight. And don't forget, next week is all calls in. But if you'd like to call in, please give us a ring. Bill will be standing by. Um, we have bounced all over the place, but let's talk now. You can get into your other book a little bit more if you'd like to discuss more of what that's about. Sure. Um, I mentioned a couple times that the UFO community, uh, maybe better called the UFO subculture, has a tendency to to try to to pull people into one camp or other and uh, persuade people. It can it can become a lot like uh, lobbying efforts or even rooting for a favorite sports team or something, uh, where it becomes ideological and not so much about and often rarely about credible research that that meets professional research standards. And I felt like in the grays had been framed that. I had some things to say that that needed to be said about topics such as hypnosis as a memory retrieval tool and some of the uh, the way that researchers were put on pedestals and not questioned about their tactics and uh, con continue. Uh, by a certain segment of the community 
um, that, that doesn't understand memory, that doesn't understand uh, the damage that can be done to people that use memory retrieval techniques to try to hammer at a single memory from 20, 30, 45 years ago. And I started getting into as well in that book the, the way that the intelligence community overlaps into the uh, UFO genre. And there, there's a disturbing similarity between um, UFO hypnotism and the satanic panic memory retrieval and, and how people were accused of um, just terrible things that they didn't do and the intelligence community use of hypnosis as, as an interrogation tool. And we tend to think that that stopped uh, around the MK Ultra era, maybe during the mid-70s. But there's plenty of evidence that it continues to be used, hypnosis, as an interrogation technique in the... Uh, uh, intelligence community and as a way to uh, try to influence people. And so I, I explore that and I explore some specific cases uh, like, like we mentioned earlier, the Bill Moore case. But there were other people during that era as well that had strange interactions with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations and that seemed to have been set up to some extent. Simone Mendez is, is who I'm talking about, and I explore her case and a few other cases as well uh, in specifics that, um, we again, we just find this overlap with the intelligence community that it... I find it hard to believe that their primary concern is something about uh, UFOs or or uh, extraterrestrials or something of that nature in these different cases. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's a, a question from Jackson. Jack, what FOIA document has made the biggest impression on your work within FOIA? That's a good question. The first one that comes to mind is one of the things that made me say, okay, I'm just going to go with a book about NICAP was FOIA documents I got from the FBI on Nicholas de Roquefort, who was almost certainly a CIA asset and was heavily involved in the China lobby in 1950s Washington, D.C., and was in a circle of friends at the highest highest levels of, of government. Um, when the FBI was doing their investigative review on him, they went all the way to the Joint Chiefs of Staff for statements on him because he knew people there. And then this guy, for whatever reasons, was a NICAP organizer and uh, one of the first people to work in NICAP. And the FOIA document that I got that I thought was really interesting was that while the Washington field office was doing an investigation on Roquefort, they sent... Director Hoover, a memo that is heavily redacted, heavily blacked out, that states that they talked to a confidential informant about Roquefort and that the information was given to them under the agreement that it was not to be shared with other agencies or investigators or even outside of. Hoover's office. And so when the Washington FBI man sent this to Hoover with his reports, he sent copies of the reports for the other offices, but only this one letter to Hoover. 
and the information is blacked out that the informant gave him about Roquefort. And very interestingly, this was the month after NICAP was incorporated. It was November 1956, during the time Roquefort was working with NICAP. I requested a review of the document for further disclosure, and the FBI conducted the review but declined to offer any further information on it. And so that really intrigued me and I began looking more and more into Roquefort and his associates that were involved in incorporating and launching NICAP. Hmm. Now, what caused NICAP to basically fall apart in 1980? I saw there was some, a lot of infighting. Do you think any of that was related to the intelligence community? Well, there were always... Uh, people linked to, if not directly employed with the CIA in the final years of NICAP, uh, on its board, managing it, uh, taking care of phone calls, things like that. The demise of NICAP really started in 1969 when they uh, removed Donald Kehoe and Gordon Lore from their positions, and uh, they they put some other people in, and morale was bad. They tried to hang on during the '70s, and uh, e even did some some reasonably interesting investigations and printed some materials that were reasonably interesting, but it never had the boots on the ground enthusiasm that the mid-1960s NICAP had. And uh, by the 1980s was little more than uh, just a name on paper. And I think it was 1982 was actually uh, sold to um, the Center for UFO Studies and uh, the Allen, uh, J. Allen Hynek group. But even in the 1960s, uh, Kehoe was starting to lose his swagger with NICAP. And uh, when the point came that the congressional hearings and a UFO study conducted at the University of Colorado, known as the Condon Report, um, didn't go the way Kehoe and NICAP wanted, some people feel like that the CIA said, okay, now's our chance. Let, let's stop this shenanigans. Other people feel like Kehoe kind of dug his own grave and that people were tired of bashing the Air Force, bashing the CIA. Um, remember, that was a point in time that patriotic Americans wanted to be behind the FBI and the Air Force. and. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. a much different time. Um, I tend to think a little of all of that's involved. If, if the CIA launched NICAP, which I'm pretty thoroughly convinced it did, and I think there were people working with NICAP that didn't need to be read into that information. I think Donald Kehoe was probably one of them. I think Gordon Lore was. I, I think that their intentions were sincere and that they were trying to do good work. I just feel like that if the CIA launched the organization, then it wouldn't have just thrown it to the curb over the years, and it was not going to leave it up to chance for how it played out. And I think that's why CI associates were brought in in the 70s um, to act as president and remain on the board and uh, just kind of keep it um, officially open if other opportunities came along that were needed. But at some point, they just uh, dissolved the organization. And it might be interesting to see the timeline of what was going on in MUFON 
with the intelligence organizations. And as these guys aged out and they just kind of shuddered NICAP, if then we were kicking back into gear with the aviary and Bill Moore and his crew um, and MUFON and groups like that. Um, so someone just wrote in the chat that they can't get through on the phone line. So hopefully Bill is uh, listening. Uh, so keep trying. Uh, so earlier you said that you did not know Oh, the line's not working. Okay, I just see the text. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, maybe it is. I'm 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 not sure what's going on. Anyway, um, you said you didn't know about a specific case because you didn't throw down the gauntlet on it. Do you have any cases you've thrown the gauntlet down on? Um, somewhat I do. Uh, NICAP in general would be one. Um, and the grades have been framed. I went pretty hard into the Emma Woods case. Uh, I know about that one. Yeah, I and, and one I, yeah. I dissected it pretty heavily. I was pretty interested in uh, Carol Rainey and Bud Hopkins' association, and I went through it as well. Uh, the Leah Haley case was fascinating to me. And again, by this point in my research, the uh, into in two thousands, and I I published that book in two thousand six. I was interested in social circumstances, and I wasn't expecting to find a really peculiar, uh, high strangeness type of thing. As much as I was interested in. What can we uh, establish happened? Like, like we're we're never gonna know, you know, what someone thinks they saw or or that kind of thing. But we can establish that this researcher called this person on this date, and they said this, and then they met with this person, and this intelligence community member had this to say. And this intelligence community person told the newspaper this about Leah Haley and things like that that interested me. And I, I took a deep dive into that. And thus, the name of the book, uh, The Grays Had Been Framed, Exploitation in the UFO Community, is that whatever the reasons that, that some of these people did find themselves interacting with researchers that we question their their motives or members of the intelligence community that their agenda is unclear it's clear enough that the circumstances were exploited for reasons that we often can't really uh, identify. Sometimes it seems apparent enough. Um, other times it, it's less so. And we seem to almost be on this spin cycle, pardon the pun, in ufology that this just keeps happening, that uh, PhDs, intelligence community members, uh, seemingly sincere people get caught in this wave of saying extraordinary things and the stuff never really pans out. And then at some point we're just uh, looking back at it and some new group is doing it again. Just seems to, to happen over and over. And to me, that is probably most disappointing among the academics because the intelligence community people may be doing their jobs to some extent, or at least in some circumstances, whatever that propaganda or public relations campaign or that job may be. The, the people that see the UFO genre uh, as I originally did through a lens of, wow, I wonder what these flying saucers are. I wonder what happened to Betty and Barney Hill and things like that are understandably just trying to figure out and, and learn more about what's going on. So I think I hold most responsible the academics that 
were educated to know better and they know the professional research process and they understand when they are and when they are not uh, talking out their rear end, for lack of a better term. And so that's the people that I, I think I hold most responsible for it is the academics that don't um, put up or shut up, but will keep doing interviews and talking about all this exciting stuff that they're hoping to find. And, oh, okay, so maybe they're, maybe they're just uh, speculating and they're entitled to like anyone else. But a problem with that is like any story like that, the correction doesn't get near the FaceTime that the initial fantastic claim does. And when they come along with a paper five years from now that says, um, never mind, um, it wasn't so fantastic, there are still people clinging to the beliefs that, that were floated and asserted in the first place. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, I apologize for, to the people that the phone line uh, was not working. Thanks for trying to call in. Um, and someone mentioned what you thought about, you know, the uh, new fork, the call in center. Now that's not something that would ever be infiltrated, something like that. I mean, that's just a, a single guy, Peter Davenport, basically taking in reports. Um, so nothing my, really. My interactions directly with Mr. Davenport have always been good. He's been helpful when I've asked him about reports. Uh, I could say more so than the Mutual UFO Network. He's at least willing to give a response for a blog post. He's willing to direct me to reports that were filed. Um, I haven't gotten that same kind of uh, um, collaboration or um, assistance from other groups like MUFON. So I, I don't have anything um, negative to say about, about, New Fork or Mr. Davenport, um, I can certainly understand where in his day that that was an idea of something to do. And um, like you were saying uh, about the persistence of researchers, he, he stuck with it and he kept with it for many years. Right. Here's another question that came come up. Just ignore the last part. It says, Jack, what, is, what has been your biggest takeaway for today from your research on the UFO and tell history like NICAP? That there is an undeniable element of the intelligence community on an ongoing basis in the UFO subculture. As I mentioned earlier, I think the reasons change from one specific instance to the next but I think it's largely misunderstood by the public at large and the people uh, like myself that come into this wanting to learn more about UFOs. I don't think that we understand the extent that the intelligence community is involved in it and manipulating it. And even people that will come in and be at it for a few years often don't understand the extent of what happened 20 years ago and 30 years ago and 40 years ago and how repetitive it is. And there's, see, there's an element, as I was saying about academics and intelligence members, there's an element of deception there that while they may not, they may or may not allude to it's never happened before and that stuff happening now is new. But by not educating their following about what's taken place in the past, there, there's a certain element of deception 
and lying through omission. And some outright misrepresent circumstances and then don't correct them. And uh, so that would be my main takeaway is um, I wouldn't rule out that there's some unusual phenomena that is yet to be better understood. But it is undeniable that the intelligence community has had a front row seat in the way the topic is massaged and interpreted by the public since the very outset of the modern UFO phenomenon in the 1940s. It's all very interesting. We have two questions. We only have three minutes left. We'll see if you can get these answered. Have you ever heard of the term UCT, uncorrelated targets? It's a NORADS acronym for the phenomenon. I never heard that before. Um, not off the top of my head. If I've come across it, it didn't resonate with me for some reason. Yeah, we don't need other ac acronyms, <laughs> really. UAP and the uh, the new thing that Congress, I mean, that uh, the government has set up has so many letters and, and we have to make up a funny word for that one. I don't know if you saw that. It's a big, oh, yeah, it's crazy. Insane. Yeah. Um, here's another question here. Are these intelligence agencies responsible military or civilian or both? And to what degree? Um, they're, they're military. I mean, they're not civilian. They're, they're government, right? Yes, and it would depend on specifically what we're talking about. Um, like in NICAP, uh, the CIA certainly had an interest in the launching of the organization, and it had relationships with civilian groups um, that, that one was called Council Services and was a public relations uh, firm. Another was a government agency called the Economic Cooperation Agency that uh, acted as an asset for the CIA. And I think that that's a really common theme. I know it is in the intelligence community um, bag of tools to have uh, government agencies acting on its behalf and um, assets in key positions that it can count on for favors and information. All right. Well, we made it. We did the whole show. And I do want to apologize to the uh, people that were trying to call in. And considering next week's a call-in show, hopefully that will be fixed. But thank you so much, Jack. It's always been a pleasure. I like your level-headedness and, and your opinions uh, are, are very good in my opinion. How do you like that? Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure, and I appreciate it, Martin. All right. You take care now, and we'll talk soon. All right, everyone. So that's it for the show tonight. Thank you so much. Don't forget, next week, uh, get your, uh, well, we can talk about anything. Talk about a UFO sighting. Uh, you want to, uh, you have some questions. We're taking calls, and it's just a call-in show only next week uh, for a 500th show. Thank you so much. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky.